This morning, we're in the Gospel of Mark. We're in the first verse through verse 20. So I'd invite you to join along with us. We're going to read the account. It's quite an incredible account, very familiar to, to many of us. It's, it's the demoniac. It's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a, a, an interesting account that we come to. Let's read it together. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one can bind him, not even the, with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountain and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. The herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled and they told it to the city and to the country and they went out to see what, was, what it was that happened. And they came to Jesus and they saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who said it, or those who saw it, told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from the region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit. He said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim to Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. What an account. Jesus had been on the Sea of Galilee. He had crossed over from the other side of the Sea of Galilee to this particular place. We know that it was the Gadarenes. And when, when you make it to Israel today, there's a very distinct place that, that really de describes what it is that, that's taking place right here. It's interesting that Jesus on the night before was in the middle of a storm. The disciples, four of them, fishermen by trade, and they thought they were all going to die. They were going to drown as the waves started to crash in and the waves started to, to, you know, slap the boat around. And Jesus stands up and he says, peace be still. And the wind stops and the waves stop instantaneously, immediately. It all became calm. And Jesus was declaring that he has power over nature. He's got power over creation. That he, was, he has power to, to do what, the, what no one else is capable of doing. Jesus has the power to do it. In this account, he's showing his power over the spiritual realm, the demonic realm. 
He just says a word and, 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 they, and they obey. And we're, we're going to look at that account next week or next time we're in, in chapter 5. We'll finish up chapter 5. And Jesus is going to heal two people. He's going to heal a, a girl that was 12 years old that had died. He's going to bring her back to life. And he's going to heal a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. And he's going to declare in that account that he has power over disease and over sickness and over death. You see, Jesus is demonstrating his power to us and to his disciples and to the world in these three accounts. It's interesting that they had left that storm with a question. Notice the question at the end of chapter 4, verse 41. They feared exceedingly and they said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I find it ironic that, that the, the, the demons have no question who it is. Here the disciples are cry, trying to figure out who he is. The, the demons said this is the son of the most high God. They were aware of who they were dealing with. Very, very quickly they, they identified who it is that Jesus was. The son of the most high God. It's an interesting account because as you, as you look there in um, verse 2 there, Jesus lands the boat, right? This long day of ministry the day before and all night long on the Sea of Galilee. It appears to be very early in the morning. The boat hits ground. And here is a man who had been tormented his, possibly his whole life, most likely his whole life. Luke tells us he was naked. Mark tells us that he had been cutting himself. So you, 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 you kind of picture, I mean, th- th- this man who could not be tamed by anybody. He, he wasn't living in a normal society. The tombs is where they buried the dead. He was living in the graveyard. And Jesus goes out of his way to find this man. He didn't see him as a demon-possessed man. He didn't see him as a, as, as a distraught man. He didn't see him as, as the man that everyone else saw when they looked at this man. He saw him as a man who needed help, who was desperate. And here was this man. That we're told that, that he would hell, that he would cut himself, he would cry out, day and night in the tombs. He was a legend. I, I, I just kind of imagine that the, the, the disciples or the apostles that were fishermen, they would fish at night, they'd fish all night long, they, they would hear him screaming in the background, right? Just like, there he is again. The Yarona. And everyone knew about this guy. Everyone was aware that, that this guy, you know, had his issues and, and his, his possessions and, and that no one was able to tame him. And they would hear him night after night and week after week and year after year. And he's out there screaming. And Jesus beelines it for this man. They get to the shore and he jumps out. And I can only imagine what the disciples are thinking, the apostles that are in the boat thinking, because here's a naked man, all cut up, running toward them. That's when he goes, hey, let's get back in the boat. (laughs) That way. (laughs) But as he gets close, it says that he falls down. They use the word worship here. The word worship literally means to fall prostrate. It means just that you lie there and and submission. And that's that's what takes place here. He just lies there in submission. He lies there knowing that someone greater than himself was there. and And he just falls to the ground. It's interesting that reading through just these first five chapters of the Gospel of Mark, but it's everywhere else in Scripture as well, that that there's an awareness that there's a spiritual realm, there's a demonic realm, there's an evil realm. 
You, you, you can't deny that from reading your Bible, that, that the Bible constantly tells us there's a war going on between truth and error. There's a, there, there's a war going on between evil and good, and there is a such thing as angelic and demonic, and those realms are real. And Jesus here is going to put on display who has the authority and who has the power we're told in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 13, I love this. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. He's delivered us from darkness. Well, you and I, I no doubt was living in darkness, rebellion to God, disobedient to God. But God conveyed us. He changed us. He transformed us. And now you are part of the kingdom of the son of his love. A big transformation took place in, in most of your lives, my life for sure. It's interesting that Paul in the book of Ephesians in chapter six, he says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, he makes a very clear, you know, description for us that there's another realm it has rankings there's spiritual hosts there's 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 demonic forces that are working and it's and it's satan's agenda to oppose god he's always looking to oppose god he, he's, he's always looking to harass men who are made in the image of god that, that's why satan is looking to inhabit mankind that's why he's looking for bodies to dwell in because you were made in the image of god and he wants to distort the image of god and so his his, his continual um, pursuit is to thwart any plans god has any 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 activity that god desires and so satan here doing a very good job with this man it's, it's interesting that through the new testament we, we, we see uh, uh, just an enormous amount of, of spiritual activity taking place Demon, jesus is casting out demons constantly as we're going through it you have to wonder if there wasn't a heightened activity of spiritual attack because the Messiah was now living on the earth. It seems like, like Satan is aware of, of what's happening around him on, on the spiritual planes. And it seems like in this in account that, that there's just an, an enormous amount of spiritual warfare a lot of spiritual possessions taking place when jesus comes on the scene there's an interesting passage and we're going to start the book of revelations here on wednesday nights in two weeks but one of the passages in, in revelations chapter 12 in the 12th verse it says that satan knows that his days are short and therefore he's you know causing more havoc in in the last three and a half years of world history and i i, I would tend to believe that we're, you and i are are seeing those kinds of things transpire in our day. I, I think he knows his days are short now. And so we're, we're watching a lot bolder, uh, you know, display of, of satanic activity taking place. You, 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 you look at, you know, the, the satanic temples and, and the conferences, that there's Satan conferences that are happening and, and they're saying the largest crowds ever are, are attending these things. Right here in Albuquerque, a satanic temple, you can actually go and get a, a, a ritual abortion at the satanic temple right here in Albuquerque. Satan clubs in our schools after school. They're, they're, they're trying to start Satan clubs throughout the nation. It seems like, like you know, you look at media, you look, you look at, you know, uh, the Emmy Awards, you look at all of these different activities, and it, they're just blatantly proclaiming satanic and demonic things. And I, I think, I think it, it's, it's indicative of, what, of what's happening in our, in, our, in our culture, in our world. I, I think Satan knows his days are numbered. I think he knows that all this is, is coming to an end. And it's interesting that Jesus ref 
refers to these guys as demons or unclean spirits. He doesn't call them devils. There's only one devil. That, that's Satan himself. These, these are unclean spirits. These, these are demons that are inhabiting this guy. And it seems that they long to, to live inside of a, of, of, a, of a vessel. They're looking for somewhere to occupy. And they're, all, they're always looking somewhere to, to inhabit. And they're always looking to undermine what God is doing. It's interesting that as you, as you look at this passage you, you see this one man had multiple demons not just multi he's going to call himself legion a legion in a roman army would be six thousand troops thereabouts and so what, what, what he's saying is look we're, we're a whole army in here there's a whole host of us living inside of this man it's not just one. It's a, it, there's, there's a legion of us. There, there's a, a thousands of us. There, there's 2,000 pigs going to go off the, the cliff here in a moment as we're going through this. And, and some commentators believe, well, there's at least 2,000 of them. If, if just one demon entered every one of the pigs to cause them to jump off the cliff, then that would be a minimum of 2,000. And mul multiple demons could be living in each, each one of them. So there could be up to 6,000. We, we have no idea. What's happening here? But it, it's, it's happening. Uh, here, here's, here's what I want you to know be, be, before, before we go any further here this morning, guys. If you're a believer this morning, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus is living in your house, he's in your boat, you don't have to fear demon possession. Right? A, a, a demon can't come and live inside of you because he, and it's going to say this in 1 John 4.4, 4, if, you, if, you're, if you're concerned about that or it's a, it's a verse that you're, you, 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 you want some affirmation about, 1 John 4.4 4 says this, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The one that's living inside of you is greater than anything this world and all the demonic forces that are in this world. He can't dwell inside you and Jesus dwell inside of you. So make sure Jesus is dwelling inside of you. Right? That, that, that would, I, would, I just want to encourage you to not think that, that you know, and it's, a, it's kind of a, another, it seems every so many years that kind of idea comes, resurfaces again in the Christian community, that you can have a demon of smoking, and we're going to have to pray and get the demon of smoking out of you. You got a demon of lust, and so come on, you know, we're just going to pray, and the demon of lust, and you got a demon of burritos, or hamburgers or you know just whatever demon that you're struggling with you know you're just like you know I, I just I just I just can't stop it must be a demon no that's your flesh just stop eating the burgers right just it's just your flesh you just you just got to deny the flesh or just stop smoking or stop you know you, you and, and a lot of times those those things are hooks in you and you, you need to ask God for power to overcome those things but it's your flesh it's not a demon it's interesting that he informs us, and it's Luke who tells us that, that this man was naked. And, and it, it seems like, you know, whenever satanic or demonic activity is taking place, just all modesty is thrown out the window. This guy is sitting there in, in the nude, you know, just... just in all of his glory, you know, just no shame, you know, no, 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 no hesitancy. He's just there and, want, and everyone, you know, is, is watching this guy run around naked. Now, he's living in the tombs, which, which would have literally been a graveyard. That's that, and the tombs is where they would place the dead bodies. And, and so it, it, would, it would be considered a, a graveyard. And what is he doing? He's walking around and he's cutting himself. Guys, there, again, a, another trend in, in amongst our young and in our culture is, is you, you find these young kids that are cutting. I, I, I just cannot 
come to any other conclusion but that it has something to do with the spiritual realm. Satan is trying to mar, trying to, trying to, trying to uh, damage the human body. And so there's just some pleasure, some comfort that comes when, when you, know, you start cutting yourself. And I, I think it's spiritual in nature. And th this, this whole idea of cutting, you look what's going on in the mutilation of, of, of our young boys and young girls, trying to change them from one sex to the other sex. It, it, it's, they're, they're mutilating their own bodies in order to do that. I, I just can't help but think it has something to do with, with the spiritual um, war that's going on around us. The mutilation. We know that this guy was shackled, chains. He, he, would just, he would just snap them. A supernatural power was available to him because of these demons. And, and it, 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 was, it was pretty scary. Night and day, he would be in, in there you know, screaming and crying and cutting himself with stones. And then Jesus comes on that shore and he comes running. And it, it, it's interesting, he, he ran and he worshiped him. He runs wherever he was and he just falls down in front of him. And he cried out, we're told in verse seven, with a loud voice. And he says, what have I to do with you, Jesus? I mean, you just kind of get this, this whole like, crazy voice going on you know it, 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 he, it, there's a schizophrenia that that's part of it you know and I, I wonder how much of the schizophrenia is, is because of demonic activity as well the demons talking not the man what have we had to do with you son of the most high God I, I find this interesting the second part of verse 7 I implore you by God that you do not torment me you know what the de demons believed that Jesus was the Son of God? Do you know what they also believed? That one day they were going to be tormented. Judgment day. And they knew that that day was coming. It's, I think it's Matthew who declares in his account of this that they said that you don't throw us into the abyss, is what, what Matthew said. Luke says that you come to torment us before our time. And, and they knew that there was a specific time that that was going to take place. The demons know this stuff. And so they're, they're, they're saying, look, don't, 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 don't do this before it, it's, it's already appointed. You know, wait, let us continue to, to cause havoc while we're still you know, able to, because there's coming a time we're going to get thrown into the abyss and there's going to come a time when all of this is going to um, come to an end. There's a, there's a judgment day. There's a time of reckoning that's going to take place. And the demons knew this. It's also interesting that Jesus responds in verse 8 to them. He just simply says, come out of the man. You unclean spirit. He gave a command, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And then he asked them a question, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. You see, this man went by the pronoun they and them. Just, <laughs> that was actual. Yeah, there, was, there was many there. That, and just, just. You, you, you realize that, and you wonder, you know, again, you know, looking at, at all of this nonsense going on, when someone says, you know, I'm them or they, like, man, are, are there a couple of you in there? <laughs> or is, there is that really what's going on here? Because that, that, that's exactly what's going on with this guy's life. There, there, were, there were many there. And it's, it's interesting that, that Jesus, at this point, gives them permission. Do you remember that they asked a question, they, they, they begged him. They, notice verse 12 there. So the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. There was, there was a, a request made. They were begging, you know what, let us not be thrown into the abyss right now. Let us not, you know, be cast out and, and, and go to our place of torment. Let us go into the swine, rather. And Jesus gives them 
their request. Jesus gave them permission. Did you notice verse 13? At once, Jesus gave them permission, and they could not do so without the permission of Jesus. Interesting. And then we're told the unclean spirits went out, they entered the swine, about 2,000 of the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea, and they drowned in the sea. Could you imagine being on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and all of a sudden you see pigs flying? <laughs> Just... <laughs> 2,000 of them, one by one, they're just jumping off the cliff, and, and you're just like, what in the world? Where's the camcorder? Where's your phone? Put video that. That would be a TikTok hit, wouldn't it? As, there, is there, as, as they, they just jump into, and they drown in the sea. By the way, this is where the term deviled ham came in. I try to resist, I can't, I just. <laughs> it's here that those who were feeding the swine panic. Could you imagine, you're, you're, you're the one who's in, taking care of this whole herd of 2,000. That's a big herd. You get all these pigs there, you know, all the swine there, and, 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 and you're the one that's responsible for them, and you see the whole herd jumping off the cliff, and you're going, oh, man, I'm in trouble. They run into the city, and they didn't go to the city. They went to the country. That means it, this, this wasn't just like a, a five-minute jog, guys. Th th these guys, for quite a bit of time, are running around with their hair on fire, telling everybody, you're not going to believe this. Come and check this out. You're not going to believe this. And through the whole countryside and through the whole city, everyone is kind of like, what is wrong with these guys? What is going on over there? And so this, they, make, they make this crowd, and they come out to see what's happening. And they get there. And the first thing that they see when they get there, watch, watch what it says. They came to Jesus. They saw, verse 15, they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. Here was this man that was uncontrollable, naked, cut it, cutting. And he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's got a robe on, covering himself. And it says, and he was in his right mind. And it brought fear to them. You think the greater fear would, that, would be that demoniac with the demons running around screaming at everybody and chasing everybody down the street. But the fear was that they saw him there with a total transformed life. He wasn't being tormented. He wasn't being harassed. He, 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 wasn't, he wasn't taking uh, rocks and, and slicing his own, his own flesh at this point. He's just there in, in total peace. And it says they were afraid. I, I think the next verse gives us a little insight into why they were afraid, or at least how they responded to that fear. Look what it says there in verse 16. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And so they get, they get the whole account. You know, this, you know, this guy who was this madman, he, he, he ran, he fell at the feet of Jesus, and all of a sudden, man, we, the, the, the pigs are up on the top, and, and they start to go into this, this frenzy, and they just all jump off the side of the, and they get the whole story. And, and that man that was sitting there at Jesus' feet is there just calm that whole time. 
And they turned to Jesus. And they began to plead with Jesus to depart from the region. Does, does that sound like awkward to you? They, they come to Jesus and they say, hey, we need you to leave, man. We don't want you here. After experiencing such a great miracle, after seeing that this man who was, who was destined to, to, to destruction, sitting there with complete peace. And you have to ask the question, what, what's going on in the hearts and in the heads of these people? Why would they want Jesus to leave? I, I'm sure some of them had some sons and daughters that were on fentanyl. They, 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 had, they had to have some, some family members that, that, were, that were all messed up, living life you know, aimlessly and purposeless. And you would think, you know what, Jesus, would you come to my house? I got one of those at my house too. I got someone that's so messed up. If you can heal him, you can definitely heal this one. If you can free that one and give him peace, you can definitely do that in my house. You, you, you would think that they would be inviting Jesus rather than rejecting Jesus. I'm convinced, I'm convinced that these guys were more concerned about their profits, their possessions, their wealth, than they were about this man's soul who had been freed. And how many people make that same decision? If I yield my life to Jesus, man, then then I'm not going to be able to do the things I used to do. I'm not going to be able to lie, to cheat, to connive. I'm not going to be able to to somehow, you know, do things that that right now I do in order to get ahead. And if I have, if I come to Jesus, I'm going to have to give all that up. So you know what? Just Jesus, just go away. I don't want to have to close down my, my bar. I don't, I don't want to have to change my profession. I don't want to have to do something that's going to have to have integrity in it in, 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 in any way. So I would rather ask Jesus just, just, to, just to depart. And I, I think for many, that decision was made because of that very reason. I think it wasn't just the profit. I think it was also the pleasures, the appetites. You mean I'm not going to eat bacon next week? All those pigs gone? Are you kidding me? What am I going to have for breakfast tomorrow? (laughs) The pleasure isn't just the appetite. The pleasure is is, is the things that, that... you would have to change if you came to faith in Christ, if you were to yield yourself to the Lord. I, I'm going to stop living a life of immorality. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop having sexual activity outside of, outside of God's design for it. I, I'm going to have to stop doing all, all the things that, that are, are, are wrong and evil in God's eyes. And so there's a lot of people who say, you know what, I, I just want my pleasures, man. I don't want Jesus in my boat. If Jesus is going to follow me, if Jesus is going to be with me, if I'm, if I'm going to be, you know, he's going to be living in, in, in my town, then I'm going to have to make some, some transformations. And, and I would rather not have to make those transformations because I enjoy my profit and I enjoy my pleasure. So I, I'm, just, I'm just going to have them leave. And, and how, how many people have made that choice? I, I can tell you this, for 10 years... I made that choice. For 10 years, I, I, I said, man, if, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm not going to have all the fun that I want to have. I'm not going to be able to do the drugs I want to do. I'm not going to be able to get drunk the way I want to get drunk. I'm not going to be able to be sexually perverted the way I want to be. So what I'm going to do is I, I'm, I'm, I, just, I just don't want Jesus. And so how, how, how many people choose 
that they would, they would rather be without Jesus so that they can enjoy the pleasures of life rather than, than just say, you know what, God, I, I, I want you to come and do what you need to do to change this life. I want peace. I want to be able to sleep at night. I want to have the, 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 the joy that you provide rather than the term, turmoil and the torment. And this man... I, 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 I love this guy. I, I think he's, he's, he's one of those guys we're going to see in heaven that we're just, we're just he, he's going to have some stories to tell. So I was the dude with the legion, remember me? <laughs> this, is, this is what's amazing. Verse 18. And when Jesus got into the boat, this, this, this is what what's fascinates me, is that Jesus heeded their request. You don't want me here? Then I'll go somewhere else. And I tell you, man, there's a lot of people that, that, that just kind of like, I'm okay with Jesus as long, long as he's you know, at a little distance from me. But I, I just, I don't want him inside. I, I don't want him ruling anything. I don't want him the Lord of anything in my life. And Jesus said, if that's what you want, then that's what I'll do. He'll never force you. And so as they pleaded with him to leave, he gets into the boat. Look at, look at the, the end of verse 18. And he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. And here's, here's the, the third person begging Jesus. The demons were begging Jesus. The, the, the community that was there was begging Jesus. And now this man who's been freed from the demons is begging Jesus. And you know what, what's incredible? Is that Jesus only didn't honor one of the requests. And it was the one demon-possessed guy that would have been freed from the demons. That he didn't honor the request. You would think of all the people he would have honored the request of. It would have been this guy. But God didn't honor the request because he had a plan for his life. I, I tell you, Christian, there, there's sometimes you, you think you know what's best for your life when God says, you know what, I got a mission for you. And this, this guy is about to be commissioned to go out into a land that he's going to have an impact upon because that was God's purpose for him. And God has a purpose for you. But you have to yield yourself. You, you come and say, God, this is what I want. He goes, no, that's not, that's not what I want. I want you to do something else. And then you're like, all right, Lord, that's what you want me to do. Then that, that's what I want to do. You see, notice, notice look, verse 19. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has compassion on you. And so Jesus... Jesus sent this guy on a mission. I want you to go back. I don't want you to get in the boat with me. You're not going to cross over to the other side. You're not going to follow me for the next, you know, two, three years that, that I'm going to be doing ministry. You're going to go back into the city that you came from. And you're going to tell people what I did for you. How I had compassion on you. Because you were once possessed, but now you're free. And this man would take Jesus up on his, his request. You see, guys, I, I don't think it was just his request. I, I think it's our request. You know, there's people that, that, that only you can reach for the kingdom. There, there's people that when they hear your story, they're, 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 they're going to go, man, I, I cannot believe you. You're, you're a Christian. You're serving the Lord. You're doing the things God's asked you to do. That, that's crazy. Because they know you. They know what you used to be. They know what you used to do. And you're the voice that's going to have a greater impact upon their life than anybody else would ever have. They can come and hear me all day long and they just look at me like, like I'm crazy. But you tell them what God's done in your life and they're going to go, man, is that really? 
Because God has a certain mission for you. Just like he did for this, this man who was freed from the demons. He was to go back into his community, to his own families. I'm sure mom and dad are like, not you. Seriously? I'm sure his brothers and sisters, you know, who had, who had you know, just said, man, yeah, he, 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 he's homeless. He's, he's living in the caves. I mean, I, we don't even talk to the guy. And all of a sudden he's there and he's saying, you're not going to believe I had an encounter with Jesus. He delivered me. He freed me. I, all those demons that harass me every night, they're all gone. I'm not cutting myself anymore. I'm not drunk every night. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not using meth every night. You know, I, I, I'm free from the, the, the bondage that I once in because of Jesus. Who knows if he had a family? Sons or daughters, a wife. But at some point, he just, he just lost it, and he, he, he just went and began to hang out in the caves, and, and, and he goes back home, and he says, man, I, I'm sorry, but God's changed me. You see, that this man has a story. And when God comes in and, and he begins to occupy your life, you have a story. What he's delivered you from, where he's delivered you from. I, 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 love, I love his passion. Look, look at verse 20. He departed and he began to proclaim in Decapolis. Now, now Decapolis was ten cities. All right there in that same little region, 10 different cities. This guy just didn't stop at his family. He started going to the neighboring city and to the neighboring city and to the neighboring city. And he just began to tell everybody. And, and he was most likely a legend. Remember the guy over there at the tombs? That's me. And God freed me. He's had compassion on me. He's taken all my shame all my guilt, all my scars, all my past, and he's washed it clean. This man told his story over and over and over again. And notice what it says at the end of verse 20. And all marveled. Everyone who heard it went, wow. Guys, I, I'm convinced a revival took place in Decapolis. I think people who were hopeless and helpless realized that there was hope and there was help. Because if God can touch legion, he can touch anybody. And it's the same God that's able to do the same thing today. No matter where you've been, no matter what your past is, no matter how messed up you were, no matter how many scars you may have, God's right there. And he wants to deliver you. And he wants to free you from the bondage of sin. He wants to free you from the consequence of sin. But you have to choose. Because it's going to cost you something. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. The cross is an instrument of death. And the instrument of death is saying that I, I don't own me anymore. I, I've given my rights. I've yielded my life over to him. And now he owns me. And I'm just going to follow him. 
this morning, before we close, before we conclude, if God this morning is speaking to your heart, you've been fighting him, you've been resisting him. You, 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 you can choose your pleasures over him, he'll let you. You can choose your, your possessions over him and he'll let you. But if you want to be free, you want to be forgiven, you, you want the peace that only he can provide you, then you have one choice and that's to say, God, I, I give. I want to ask you to come and be the Lord of my life. I want to ask you to come and free me from every vice, from every evil thing that I've partaken in. I, I want to ask for you to forgive me for all those things and then give me victory over all those things as well. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up this, this morning. God is speaking to your heart. Then I'm going to invite you to take a step of faith. I'm going to ask you to stand up right where you're at and walk right here in front of this platform. And I want to pray with you. As you today invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. And he's going to wipe away, man, your shame, your guilt, your past, your hurt. That's what he does. Father, we thank you for tonight, for today, for this morning, for this time. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit, God, would continue, God, just to do what you did there in the gatherings. That you would do it right here this morning, God. That you would deliver us. Forgive us. And fill us, God, with your spirit. Father, we ask for you, God, just to move amongst us right now. And Lord, I pray if there's any of us here who have yet to surrender, God, that today would be the day where we would finally say, God, I, I give. As we sing this chorus, we worship the Lord together. God is speaking to your heart. You're out in the foyer. Someone's going to open up that side door. You're here in the sanctuary and God is speaking to you. I'm going to ask you to stand up and just make your way right here in front of this platform. And I want to pray with you as you by faith ask Jesus Christ to come in and be the Lord of your life. No one can do that for you. Your mom can't do it. Your dad can't do it. Your grandma can't do it. Your husband can't do it. Your wife can't do it. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend. No one else can make that decision. It's your decision. And if God is speaking to you this morning, make that decision. As we worship, as we sing, as God speaks to you, man, would you take that step of faith and say, God, I, I heard you this morning. I, I'm ready. Let's worship. How great the cat that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the dark your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living
if there's anybody else. You see, guys, in a moment like this, there's a, there's a spiritual battle taking place right here, right now. Kind of like that little cartoon. You got the little devil on one side and you got the little angel on the other side and they're just kind of trying to convince you. One's trying to convince you to just surrender, just give. Just finally, once and for all, say, God, I, I'm done. But there's, there's, there's that little other voice saying, not now. Maybe next week, maybe next month. The Bible says this, today is the day of salvation. Today. If you hear his voice today, don't put it off another day. Because here's the danger. You hear his voice now and you reject it and your heart's pounding and you're fierce. You're just like, man, I don't know what's going on. I'm feeling nervous and my palms are sweating. That, that, that's the Holy Spirit trying to convict you and trying to get you to that place where you finally give. But you ignore that. The next time, it's a little bit harder. Your heart becomes a little more calloused. And every time you hear it, and every time you reject it, you become a little bit harder, and a little bit harder, and a little bit harder. So at some point, you go past feeling. That's what the Bible describes, your past feeling. You don't even feel that conviction anymore. You just like, I, I, it, it, it doesn't bother me. And that's a dangerous place to be if it doesn't bother you. We're gonna sing that one more time, man. If you're there wrestling, I encourage you, man. Surrender, humble yourself and say, God, I, I know you, you are who you said you are. It takes more courage to stand for the Lord than it does to, to stand for anything else. And I would encourage you, if God's speaking to you, man, take that step of faith. Just like this young man here, man, that's so cool. Excited for you, bro. If there's anybody else and God is speaking to you, we're gonna sing that one more time. God's speaking to you, come, come. God bless you, come. Come, God speaks to you, come. Just, just really quick, man, if you're still sitting in your seat and, and you're, you're warring, you're just like something's holding me down, I don't know what, what's going on here. You see, this is an act of your will. These guys just made a choice out of their own will, their own volition, and said, you know what, I, I, need, I need to respond to God. And if you're still sitting there and you're, you're, you're wrestling with that, man, I, I, I think this, the most important time it's when we have to wrestle and so if you're still sitting in your seat and god is speaking to you man we'll wait for you we'll we'll wait another another minute if there, if you're still in that position where you're going man I, I i just i don't know how just do it just give and I, I would encourage you to not wait another minute another day if there's anybody else i just want just want to make sure that you had that opportunity this morning 
Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to pray, guys. Excited for you, man. The most important decision of your whole life you've made this morning. And it's that decision to ask Christ to be the Lord. And we're going to pray and ask him to do that together. If you would join me, a simple prayer by faith, you talking to him. I'm just going to help you through it. But this is your prayer. And this is to him, okay? So let's, let's pray together. Let's pray. Dear God, I confess I'm a sinner. I thank you for sending Jesus. That he saved me. That he died in my place. That he rose from the grave. And he defeated death. God, would you fill me with that same spirit? Would you be the Lord of my life? Would you guide me? Direct me. From this day forward, God, I surrender all. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God.